there's a special subgenre of games that you hear about sometimes called Eurojank. It usually describes Eastern European games that are janky and awkward at points, but almost always are deep and interesting with unique gameplay mechanics. Now you might hear the name and think that these games are bad or just mediocre, but some of them are incredible experiences and can offer a lot if you can get past their shortcomings. There's so many excellent games in the Eurojank category that it's hard to say that any single one of them could be the best. But if I had to try and make a list, Metro would be coming in right towards the top. It's a really special game, and I'll try and break down why in this video. Before we get into the gameplay, some background info might be useful. So Metro was developed by 4A Games, which was actually founded by some developers who'd worked on the Stalker series, which is another cult classic Eurojank game. So these guys do have a track record for making good games. Anyway, it was published and released by THQ back in 2010, but there was a Redux version released in 2014 which changed the graphics and some gameplay features, but I'll cover the differences later. For now, just note all the footage here is from the 2010 version. The last thing to note is that although the plot is not the exact same, this game is actually based on a novel of the same name, which the game makes sure you know. I'll leave the plot spoilers and why I love it so much till later, but the setup is that in 2013 a nuclear war wiped out most life on Earth with this game taking place in the Moscow Metro network. The first point I want to cover is really the core of why I love this game so much. The world building is incredible. You're playing a character making their first big trip in the Metro, and you're not meant to know much about what the world was like before the war, or what life is like in other stations, so you're discovering the world as you play. A lot of what you'll learn will come from different travelling companions that guide you through the tunnels. Most of these characters are interesting, and it makes your journey a lot more engaging as these allies come and go. Now you might think that since so much engagement comes from all these companions coming and going, that when you're alone for long stretches of times in the tunnel, that the game becomes boring. But the devs clearly knew how to combat this. They use this isolation to try and build atmosphere and tension in some of the game's more horror-centric segments. One of the things I respect most about what the devs were able to do was that they were able to craft these dark, cramped tunnels, and then contrast them with the moody, ruined city. After hours spent in the tunnel, when I was finally moving through the city, I almost felt that fear for being open on all sides seeing the demons flying around, and it made me almost long to return to the comfort of the tunnels and their confined spaces. And the tunnels aren't just about abandoned rail cars and cramped environments. You often move through stations where survivors live, and you can really feel that these stations are lived in. You see all the people crammed together, their shanty towns and their tiny beds, and you can hear them tell stories to each other. And these stories are another excellent way that the game will give you more info about the world in an organic, non-forced way. If you want to learn more, you can take your time and listen to the people of the tunnels, and if you don't, you can walk past and ignore them. The game doesn't have any dialogue menus, so you really do just join in a conversation and listen to the NPCs as you pass. I have survived somewhere else, at least for a while. But so many years have passed now, and we've heard nothing from them. The other cities didn't have defense rings like Moscow did. What a great city it was, St. Petersburg. The cathedral and the dead mountain with its spire. I remember summer nights in Yosky Avenue, crowds, laughter, kids with ice cream, beautiful slender girls, music, and the air, sweet enough to drink. What a beautiful world we've destroyed. These stories really are just little crumbs and add to the world. Again, you could run past them if you want, and I know I have on previous playthroughs. But for this review, I listened to basically all of them. It changes the pace of the game to do this, and if the world wasn't this interesting, I know I wouldn't stop to listen to them. Okay, so at this point you're probably like, I get it. Good world building. So what? Well, in a campaign only game like Metro, good world building like this is what carries any story. It's hard for a game to tell you a story about a world that's dead and boring. Why should you want to make a giant journey to help people that are never developed anyway? The world building lends itself to gameplay too. It's hard to describe, but in some missions you're moving through these abandoned stations, or looking at people fighting tooth or nail to defend their homes, and it's only because the game gave you such solid examples of what these stations should look like that you get the uneasy feeling that everything shouldn't be like this and something's gone wrong. Okay, world building out of the way, it's probably time to talk about gameplay. So Metro has a balance between action, stealth, and survival horror. In most encounters with humans, you can either go in guns blazing, or sneak around with a silencer. If you're very good, you can avoid some fights entirely. I'm not too good, so I usually sneak around a little, take down a handful of enemies before I'm spotted, and then gunfights break out, or I can try and sprint past the enemies and escape into the tunnels. The more horror elements come from when you're fighting mutants. These guys aren't too scary in general. I mean, shooting mutants is often easier than fighting humans because they're coming right at you. But when you're on your own, running low on ammo, and never know which side they're going to come at you from, then the game can get you. I should 
note, I don't do horror well. On the first time I played this game, some of these sections had me inching forward, checking every corner, trying not to get caught out. On replays, it's not as spooky, but it can still get you. There's also a point in the game where you get the option to buy one of two suits of special armor. One will help you sneak around better with night vision goggles, and the other will give you more health. Naturally, I bought the armor being sold by a squatting slab. I've seen complaints that stealth is more viable in the Redux version of the game, but it mostly works in the original, and I rarely felt that I shouldn't have been spotted any time I was. Now, I'm not going to cover every single weapon in the game, but most of the guns are really satisfying to use. They sound heavy and their muzzle flashes light up the dark environments, which is really cool in firefights. Over the course of the game, you gradually move from really shoddy Metromid weapons up to heavy-duty World War III tech, which is a very good way of keeping things fresh. Now, there's not a huge variety of weapons, but there's enough that you could run a few different combat styles on replays. Like, there's weapons I used heavily on this run that I've never used in previous runs. What weapon you end up using in part depends on the playstyle you want, but also what you have ammo for. There's no inventory management in this game, so you can carry as much ammo as you can find, with the only thing being limited is grenades and man kits. Apart from that, you have weapons in slots 1 through 5, with different weapon types in each. Slot 1 you have knives and sometimes throwing knives, slot 2 is your revolver, slot 3 is your rifles, slot 4 is shotguns or otherwise heavy weapons, and then slot 5 for grenades. In the 2010 version of the game you can't customize weapons, but there's different versions of most weapons floating around that might have silencers, different sights, so on. So normally I had heavy duty rifles and shotguns in slots 3 and 4, and then in slot 2 I had a silence scope revolver for stealth. In the 2014 version though you can customize weapons, so you don't have to compromise if you want a silenced scope revolver, but the shop only has a silenced one or one with a scope. It was never a huge issue in the 2010 version, but it's a nice quality of life thing. My favourite weapon on this playthrough was the full auto shotgun, because although it absolutely devours ammo, it's excellent for tearing down some of the toughest enemies in the game, and it sounds amazing. Apart from that, I was using the AK-47 and then a futuristic AK-2012. But enough about the guns for now, time to move on to the plot. So, if you don't want it spoiled, you can skip ahead to the time on screen now. Okay, so I'm going to try and do the plot as much justice as I can, but I had to cut out some stuff to keep down on time in this video, so forgive me. So things begin with you and a group of rangers moving towards a tower in the dead of night. But then you get pinned down by a bunch of mutants, and the game cuts back to eight days earlier. You're playing as Artyom, a man in his early 20s who lived in the far north end of the metro for basically all his life, although you were born in Moscow right before the bombs dropped. A man called Hunter comes to your station with news. Things have begun more and more dangerous in the surrounding stations, with reports of the Dark Ones. Hunter goes off to investigate, but he says if he's not back by morning, you need to go and get help from a central station far away. When he doesn't come back, you set up for Polis Station. Right from your very first trip, things aren't going to plan. An anomaly makes you and your companions pass out before you have a vision of the Dark Ones, before waking up and having to fight off mutants. After you reach your first station, you and a shady man called Bourbon leave through a haunted path that heads into the tunnels to avoid a lockdown in the station. Bourbon gets you into a fair bit of trouble because it seems that everyone who knows him wants him dead, but he helps guide you around. Bourbon's very dismissive of the paranormal elements of the metro, even though you see a fair few spooky things with him, and it's when you're avoiding some people he owes money to that you head to the surface for the first time, seeing the ruins of Moscow. Eventually Bourbon's past catches up with him and he gets killed, but about three seconds later a guy called Khan drops out of the ceiling and you two pair up. Khan is much more in tune with the paranormal side of the metro, and he shows you anomalies and spirits that haunt the tunnels. Where Bourbon was kill or be killed, Khan is much more live and let live. Eventually you two part ways when Khan decides to stay behind and help the station defend itself, but tells you to meet up with his friend in the next station. Artyom now meets the communists for the first time, and well, Things go poorly and you get handcuffed and chased across the station before Khan's friend saves you. He disguises you and sneaks you off to the front line in the Nazi communist war. I expected mutants and bandits in this game, but seeing World War II's Eastern Front recreated in metro tunnels was kind of a twist I didn't see coming. This front line mission is great. You have to make your way across a battlefield where both sides are heavily armed and both want you dead because they think you're a spy for the other side. There's even achievements for finishing this mission by killing everyone or killing no one, which are both kind of hard to get. Anyway, back to the plot. After all this, you get caught by the Nazis, but right before they can execute you, two rangers show up, and once they hear that Hunter sent you, one of them takes you to a trolley and tries to guide you to Paulus. You get stopped by Nazis at a roadblock though and have to fight your way through their lines, even taking out a panzer. My favourite set of missions is right here though. Your ranger friend gets killed by mutants, and you crash, almost getting crushed by your railcar. But being the champ you are, our team keeps going, eventually finding some troops guarding a station for mutants. You desperately hold the line but eventually get knocked out and when you come to, the guards are dead. 
You then have to go through the station you failed to defend and look at all the destruction and death that was caused by the mutants. You then find a small boy whose uncle died defending him, and you pick him up and carry him to his mother. This mission has a lot of charm because your mouth weighs more and it's harder to turn because of the weight on your back, but the kid helps spot mutants for you and tells you where Amu is stashed, so he really is a useful companion, though he doesn't overstay his welcome and this is actually the shortest companion you have. Eventually you make it to Polis, and the game does an excellent job of making you feel like this is the most important station you've ever been in, with all its soldiers and its glorious big ceiling. And after everything you've gone through, you're finally about to get the support you need for your home station. All you need to do is ask the council. Unbelievable! Unbelievable! Artyom, I'm stunned that the council has refused to help your station. Yeah, so the council basically rejects you for no reason. But the leader of the rangers, Miller, comes up with a subtle and nuanced plan of finding nukes in a secret government base and just nuking the Dark Ones. So he sends you off to the library to find them. And after some... Trouble, you get the location. You and the other rangers gear up in an orthodox church before heading out for the final few missions. This is the only stretch of the game where you work with a full unit of NPCs, so it's not shocking that most of them die pretty quickly. Anyway, on your way to get the nuke launch codes, you discover and kill an absolute eldritch horror nuclear-powered tentacle monster. But you still have the Dark Ones to worry about, so the game now loops back around to the tire from the prologue. You and the rangers fight towards the tire, and then you platform your way to the top. The section at the top of the tire is excellent, because you can see all of ruined Moscow and the Dark Ones home. This is a point though that Artyom gets overwhelmed with lots of weird visions, and some of these sequences actually become interactive with you having to run away from the Dark Ones. It's really interesting. Finally, you reach the very top of the tower and prepare to set up the nuke homing device, but have one last vision. In it, you're in a weird dreamscape and have to run away from one last dark one, at the very end being given a pistol by Hunter and shooting it. The game actually has two endings, which aren't exactly split into good or bad, but more enlightened and ignorant. In the ignorant ending, the nukes are launched and the dark ones are killed. In the more enlightened ending though, you get the choice whether or not to let the nukes launch. While the canonical ending is that the nukes are launched and Artyom looks at the burning city, only to later realize that the Dark Ones were actually friends, and simply didn't know how to communicate with humans. And with this context, a lot of the earlier visions make a lot more sense. Even children, even children hated by their parents, try to love and understand them. We wish to, under we wish to understand you, and help, and help you. Anyway, I've been talking about the plot for this game for far too long, so I should probably move on to some final things and wrap this thing up. I mentioned at the start of the video that there's two versions of this game, and I'm just going to cover some differences between them that I haven't covered up to now. So, Redux has fewer loading screens, with a bunch of missions merged into longer single missions. Loading screens never annoyed me much in the game, but this is pretty cool. The game actually wasn't just updated, it was entirely remade in the second game's engine, so graphics and lighting both got changed up. The UI got changed to match the second game, and like I said, there's weapon customization added in. There is some debate over which version is better, uh, though Redux has 90 out of 100 on Metacritic, while the original only has 81, so the reviews favor the Redux version. Anyway, only the Redux version is on Steam anymore, and realistically, it won't impact your experience much whichever version you end up getting. I'll link a graphic comparison video below if you want to check that out. In my opinion, if you have the old version, you're not really missing much, which is why I've never got the Redux version. But if you're coming into the game for the first time, I think you may as well get the new version. It's 20 euro on Steam, and it goes on sale frequently down to 5 euro. I like the devs a lot though, so I think 20 is a fair price for the game. So in conclusion, Metro is a game I'd highly recommend. You may need to give it an eye or two to get into things, but once it gets going, the game is really good. The first time I played the game was way back in 2011 on Xbox, and I didn't fully appreciate the game back then. I actually got stuck at a surface mission because I managed to run out of air filters and didn't want to restart. But then I got it in the 2012 THQ Humble Bundle, right before they went bankrupt, and in 2014 I actually got around to playing it and finished it. Then I played it again in 2019, and now in 2020 for this review. For a single player linear story, it really speaks to the quality of the game that I keep coming back. There's more games in the series and I love them too, so I'll probably cover them in the future at some point. But I would highly recommend Metro. And if you made it to this point in the review, you either own the game already or probably want to play it. Uh, making this review actually made me realize how good a game Metro is. Like, 9 out of 10 on Metacritic is really deserved. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching. This The response to the Ruse video was actually very positive, which is why I made this one so quickly. Um, if you like it, you know, like, comment, much appreciated, subscribe, show people. 
um, and comment what you thought of the video or if you have any suggestions of games I could play because that's kind of what I'm looking for at the moment. Okay, yeah, so before I ramble anymore, that's the end of the video. Uh, thanks a million for watching and I'll see you next time.